Hello and welcome to the Intelligent Design the Future podcast. I'm Casey Luskin, and once again, I have with us on the show Professor Bradley Monton, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Colorado Boulder. Professor Monton received his PhD in philosophy from Princeton University in 1999, having focused especially on philosophy of science within physics and probability, epistemology, philosophy of religion, philosophy of time, the kind of things that you talk about, you know, over the dinner table at Thanksgiving, that sort of thing. So, um, mm-hmm. Professor Monton, thank you so much again for joining us on the podcast. You're welcome. So we talked a little bit in the last podcast interview with you about the reception you received as someone who is within the mainstream academic community and thinks that intelligent design uh, has some good arguments to make and might even say that it it should be considered scientific. And also your perspective, uh, not as the uh, stereotypical ID proponent. So for our listeners that didn't get to listen to the last podcast interview with you, could you just briefly tell us about your background, where you're coming from in this debate? Sure. Um, I'm an atheist, but I'm somewhat sympathetic to the intelligent design arguments. Um, I think that they do give some evidence for the existence of God, so they make me less certain of my atheism than I would be (laughs) had I not heard the arguments. When I say intelligent design arguments, I mean to include both biology and physics-based arguments, the the idea that one can get scientific evidence for the existence of God beyond uh, just the standard... um, evolution-based arguments that the intelligent design people spend most of their time talking about. I'm more interested in uh, non-evolution-based arguments for the existence of a designer. And I also think it's legitimate to think of, to consider intelligent design as science. And I think that these issues are all independent of the issue of what should get taught in school. But fortunately or unfortunately, the, intelligence, the discussion of the intelligent design issues have really gotten caught up with what should get taught in school. So though I want to make very clear that the whole pedagogical issue of what you get taught is completely different than the other issues, I do have views about the pedagogical issues too. And I think that it would be legitimate to um, take up the intelligent design topics in a science classroom in a non-proselytizing fashion. Can, can we talk about your research focus and the book that you have written on intelligent design and, and whether it's science? Can you talk to us a little about that work? I'm submitting the final version to the publisher within the next week or two. And, okay, congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm, I, I actually am not completely sure when it's going to come out, probably summer 2009, um, maybe hopefully before, but we'll see. The title, I've been playing around with the title, and I think I'm going to call it Seeking God in Science with the subtitle An Atheist Defense Intelligent Design. And then I'm going to be clear in the book that I'm not giving a full-fledged defense of intelligent design. I'm giving a partial defense of intelligent design. I mean, there are atheists who give full-fledged defenses of intelligent design, like the Ray aliens, you know, these uh, <laughs> cult-like religious people who think that Earth was seeded by intelligent aliens. And if you Google intelligent design for atheists, you know, you'll come up with the Ray alien page. They build themselves with that. Well, okay, well, I'm not a Ray alien, um, <laughs> and, you know, but there are atheist scientists, or at least scientists who don't, you know, seem to have a particular theistic bent, mm-hmm. who take seriously the non-supernatural intelligent design hypotheses. Like Francis Crick wrote a book, Life Itself, Its Origin and Nature, where he espouses the view of directed panspermia, uh, which is the, the sort of real alien type view in the sense that Earth, uh, life on Earth was perfectly seeded by intelligent aliens. So these are intelligent design hypotheses that one could consider that aren't necessarily evolution-based. They could just be about the origin of life itself. And they're non-supernatural hypotheses. So I'm interested in those hypotheses and, you know, as an atheist, I could be sympathetic to those hypotheses and still be an atheist. I'm also interested in supernatural design hypotheses because I want to keep an open mind. I want to see if there is evidence for uh, God. Even though I don't believe in God, I'm not certain that God doesn't exist, and I want to see wh- where the evidence lies. Crick you know, really got disillusioned with the scientific arguments that life could have arisen via natural chemical processes on Earth. And so it, it was not a philosophical preference that he had, but he was in, literally compelled by the scientific evidence to look elsewhere for the origin of life. Right. And then that leaves two options. You know, it could be uh, a natural source, like intelligent aliens, or it could be a supernatural source, God. And here's where I'm definitely on the side of the intelligent design proponents, because I think that one can, in principle, investigate the question of whether there is evidence for design in nature without concerning oneself with what the nature of the designer is. I think that that is a point that <laughs> ID proponents are, are try to make very often and are often told, well, you know, you folks, that you really just believe 
that, it, that it's God, you know? So that's not credible. I did a debate recently at Western Washington University where I made the point, look, I'm not going to at all pretend that I'm not a Christian, but that's not a conclusion of intelligent design. That's right. my personal religious view. But coming from someone like yourself, yeah. Professor Montan, you don't even need to give that disclaimer <laughs> because rhetorically speaking, you don't have to go there. Exactly. Here's the way I try to put the point dramatically. You're not going to like this case. But I say, <laughs> suppose that all current intelligent design proponents died out. Like, you know, at some conference, like someone, some crazy atheist bombed their conference and they all died, right? Um, and then a new group of people came along that happened to be atheists or agnostics or what have you, but thought the arguments should be um, considered seriously. Well, y- you can't say then that the arguments are somehow secretly supernatural because the, the people endorsing the arguments don't have the supernatural belief in question. So, but it's just, it's just coincidence. It's just happenstance that the intelligent design people proponents currently haven't all died out, you know, been replaced with these new intelligent design proponents. But we can imagine that scenario happening, and that's enough to show that there's nothing logically entailed regarding the supernatural by uh, the basic claims of intelligent design, that maybe there is evidence for cosmic designer of the universe or a designer of life on Earth. And hopefully people will be persuaded of that simply by hearing the argument rather than putting it into practice. So... <laughs> <laughs> So you're writing a book. Is it on the Dover case? One of the four chapters is on the Dover case. And okay. My paper on the Dover case is online. Um, if you just Google Montan Dover, you should find it. Or if you go to my website, BradleyMontan.com, you can find it. Um, and then in my book, the first half of it's chapter two, the first half of chapter two, I basically just reprint that paper. And then I talk about responses I got to that paper and go further into the, the issues.